who gets up this early to sit down and watch folks talk about stuff like this? It's pretty admirable. Um, you know, you've been sitting for a while, and you know the blood is sort of not flowing as good as it could. So why don't you stand up? We'll get the blood flowing because you're going to learn tons, and you got to have the blood going to your head. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're standing up. Let's go ahead and just stretch a little bit. That's right. You know, stretch in different directions. Put your hands up in the air if you want. In front of you. See, that feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. To the side. I only do this because it looks really funny for me. Uh, it has no benefit to you, it's just for my pleasure. Okay, uh, twist a little bit, but gently. Don't want any injuries. <laughs> Coming from experience. <laughs> okay, that's about enough. Okay, great, you sit down there. I bet you feel better, though. I really do. I think you will. Um, so, uh, you'll learn more. What a wonderful talk, by the way, before me. That was fantastic, and the talk before that, too. I learned a lot, I hope you did, too. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of a history lesson, and then we're gonna use that history lesson to inform the future. Um, so, let's see. Um, what's this guy doing? Anybody have any idea? Hmm? Washing Everybody thinks he's cleaning the window. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> not, not opening the window either. Um, oh, so, Yes, yes. This guy is a waker-upper. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a waker-upper. His role is to tap on the window and uh, wake you up in the morning. Now, this is a little while ago, you know, not, not, not like last year. And um, yeah, through the 1700s, 1800s, kind of coincides with the emergence of factories. You know? And, um, you know, people didn't have electricity and they didn't have alarm clocks. And if they had alarm clocks, they weren't very accurate. So this guy was pretty handy. You paid him a you know, little bit of money each week and he would wake you up on time and you get to the factory on time. Um, by the way, he did a couple of other things. He also lit the uh, oil can, oil lamps at night and put them out in the morning because there was no electricity. Right? You had to have just oil candles to light stuff up and that's where there was stuff to light up. We're talking about the UK here, England, Britain, sort of the beginning of the uh, first industrial revolution. By the way, this job doesn't exist anymore. Surprise. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, and, uh, but I was really surprised. The last waker up, or <laughs> the last waker upper, did exist as recently as 1920. I think that's pretty recent. It's 100 years ago, but it's, it's uh, I would have thought it was, the role was gone a long time ago. But he w was forced out of the job because of change, right? Because of, electricity and, and better products, innovation essentially. And I think that's gonna be a little bit of my te theme today. Um, and, and you know, the message, first of all, this is just a lot of fun. I think it's just fascinating, right? So, but it does represent that change and displacement of work and people has been going on since we can remember. Um, this is a pretty short talk, but I'm gonna start with dinosaurs. Right, and then we like dinosaurs in here? Yeah, I like dinosaurs. <laughs> Um, these are not dinosaurs, but dinosaurs were around for 200 million years. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. For 200 million years, dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Way, 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 way before humans. And nothing happened. For two, for the life of a dinosaur on day one was the same as the life of a dinosaur on day 200 million years later. <laughs> Over 200 million years, dinosaurs did the same thing. They, wandered around, munching on trees and plants, and that was it, right? Compare that with humans. We think humans have been around 200,000 years. 200,000 years. If you do the math quickly, 200,000 versus 200 million, we've been here for a blimp. And look what we've done. <laughs> look what we've done, right? And here's the, here's, let's make it even more interesting. We've been here 200,000 years in this form we are right now, we think. <clears throat> For about 199,000 years of that, nothing much happened. Right? If you were a human 200,000 years ago, and you were in your little group, uh, you know, 150, 160, 180,000 years later, you were still in your little group as a human, nothing much changed. But everything started to change about 1,000 years ago. So the history of humanity is actually tiny. It's a, it's a blip. <laughs> We are so fortunate to live now in this time and have these experiences. If we lived 150,000 years ago, it was a pretty, pretty nasty life, by the way. 
didn't live very long, right? <laughs> you know, if you lived to be 30, you were lucky. 30, fine. Okay, so all the cool stuff, all the stuff that leads us to the world we have today, to the smartphones and the microphones and the speakers and the screens and the laptops, all starts about 700 years ago. 700 years ago. Anybody guess what this picture represents? Where did it happen? In Europe, there's good wine. Where are you? Greece. Greece. You're close by. You're close by. Italy, yes. And then the city. Yes, beautiful. This lady said the Renaissance in Italy. You got it perfectly right. This is Florence. By the way, great place to visit still. Try to get there before they close the doors. <laughs> it's overcrowded now. Too many tourists. 700 years ago, the modern world started in Italy. Florence, right? By the way, before this, things were not so good. One of the reasons why you started to have like people thinking big thoughts and thinking about science was because there had been this big disease previously, in the previous years. And these smart people, they're doing smart things, they're hanging out, talking big thoughts. They're, th they're saying to themselves, well, we don't want that to happen again, you know, that disease. We don't want that disease to wipe out millions of us. And this, this was at a time, by the way, when, when there weren't very many humans. Right? Okay, so if I go at this rate, we're gonna be here for three hours. <laughs> okay, better move on. 700 years ago, you get the Renaissance, then you get the Age of Enlightenment, where we start thinking about the future, you get the, the uh, scientific period, and then about 300 years ago, everything changes again. You have the first industrial revolution. First Industrial Revolution it happens out of Britain. What do you think is the big game changer? It's kind of a little, it's a trick question. It's a trick question because the answer is on my slide. <laughs> Steam, yes, well done. Whoever got that, was that you? <laughs> Very nice, brilliant. Um, so Steam happened. Steam power, you can't imagine what the world was like before Steam, right? It was, it was, it was things were moved around by animals and by humans. And, and possibly a little bit of water. But when steam started to happen, you could do really cool stuff. By the way, you could make trains. Okay? You had to have steam to have trains. And, and so here's a little nugget, I, I like this. Um, if you were born in England prior to the Industrial Revolu first Industrial Revolution, you pretty much married your neighbor. Because you, <laughs> you didn't go anywhere. Yeah? You, the person you married was probably four doors down from you. That was the way life was. It required trains for you to marry someone you didn't know. Because you get on a train, go to a different town, and meet somebody you didn't know. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so having steam changed marriage in Britain. Another few hundred years, about a, barely a hundred years later, you have the second industrial revolution, even bigger, even more profound. What was it? What was the big thing that was the change? The yeah, the assembly line was a good one, yeah. Mass production, you started to see factories. Factories brought people in from the countryside. People started to live in cities. Cities started to grow. We started to have schools police forces, all these things sort of happen suddenly, and they happen because of these revolutions. And so you have the second, but the big one, beyond the production line, was <laughs> Yes, I, you caught me. Electricity, electricity. Probably the most important thing that humans have leveraged, electricity. Nothing in this room would exist without electricity, probably including us. <laughs> it's a really big deal. Um, with electricity, by the way, you get telephones and you get telecommunications, big change. And then we get to the third, we are all in the third industrial revolution right now because the third industrial revolution is all about computers. The yeah. The what? The it is. <laughs> yeah, that's true, it's still, imagine that two or 300 years later, we're still distributing electricity, we're still building electrical wires and getting electricity to people, that's absolutely true. Electrification of the world is a project that is not yet complete. The third industrial revolution is the digital revolution, and it's, it's everything from the internet, to our smartphones, to our laptops, to our games, to Facebook, and all that sort of stuff. And now, what I'm gonna tell you about is the fourth. And what's really interesting about the fourth is we're all gonna live through it, right? Why, whereas you can look at the sort of first and second and say, well, that's gone, the world changed. We're just now experiencing the benefit of it, but now we're in the middle of the third, but there's a fourth that's emerging that is bigger and more profound than anything we've ever lived through as humans. That makes us very special. Think about that. We are 
We are the generation of humans right now that are going to live through the biggest change in humanity ever in the 200,000 years of humanity or the 1,000 years of change we've had. And I want to tell you about it, right? How am I going to do that? Uh, there are a number of ways we think about this. Why is the fourth industrial revolution different and interesting? Well, it's the scale of it. It's the scale of it, right? We are a connected world. There are almost 8 billion people on the planet. Almost, we're getting there. 8 billion humans. It's a lot of folks. <laughs> How many people are connected? How many people have access to the internet, do you think? 2 billion? Some more? About half, you said? About, so about 4 billion? Yeah, you're pretty spot on. Yeah. It's 55%, uh, so about 4.4 billion people are connected. Now, there's two ways to see that number. One is that's cool. That's awesome. 4.4 billion human beings today checked their email when they got up. <laughs> but there's a bad way to see it too, which is the other half almost didn't. They don't have access to all the cool things we have access to. Sometimes I wake up and I think they're lucky, right? Because I don't have to check email and text and WhatsApp and WeChat and Instagram. You know, they don't have to. Well, eventually they will because everyone will be connected. Now, quick story. When I was starting in tech a long time ago, not so long ago, um, <clears throat> the way I got software was a software. I went to the store. I got a box. I went home and I would install 32 disks in my computer, one after another, installed on the computer. Right? That sounds crazy, right? Mm -hmm. It was not so long ago. Today, when you want to get software, you download it in seconds on your device. When Apple wants to distribute software, or there's an Instagram update, it distributes to millions of people in minutes. The scope of this is really unprecedented. The impact is too. By the way, if you are, uh, who, who has an Android device? And then who has an Apple? Oh, this is definitely a San Francisco crowd. <laughs> you go to a different city in the Bay Area, in the country, you'll get a different set of hands. Right? But this is Apple Town here, for sure. Uh, when Apple distributes an upgrade to iOS, and it's good, we're delighted, because you get new capabilities, right? you get new features, dark mode. <laughs> Never, you know. um, if they distribute a, a bug, wow, they distribute a bug to over a billion people overnight. I can tell you, when that happens, it's not pleasant over at Apple. That's no, no fun to be there when that happens. Um, and the speed, the speed at which we're deploying new technology. Let's do a little game here. This is the game. I'm gonna ask you what you think is the length of time in years that it took 50 million people, 50 million to experience this new technology. So the question is, how long, how many years did it take 50 million people to experience commercial airlines? What do you think is the answer? Shout out. 120 years. That might be older than airplanes. Um, about 80 years? You're getting close. One more? 15? 50, 50. 64 years? We got there. We got there. Okay, you'll see the trend here. Telephone. And I'm not talking about the smartphone here. I'm talking about a telephone, the one that was plugged into the wall. Yeah. How long did it take? 40? 74 years? 10 years? Oh, 100 years? Okay. 50 years? Okay. You'll see a trend emerge here in a second. <laughs> mobile phones. Mobile. How long did it take 50 million people to use a mobile phone? 30? 100? 100. Uh, mobile phones aren't that old. <laughs> 40? 10? 12 years. Okay. See the trend? <laughs> How long did it take? 50 million people to use WeChat. Two years? Three. Three years? One year? One year. Who said one year? You're right. And? Okay. It may even be beat. These are old slides. I don't know how long Fortnite took to get to 50 million people. Maybe closer to uh, it's more than that. And finally, this idea of convergence with the unknown drop D. <laughs> I don't know why that E's there. It should be the end of the sentence. Who knows these things? Who could tell? Okay. Uh, anyone ever taken an Uber here? Yeah, I know the answer. Okay. Most of you have. Most of you know what it is, right? You, ask, you have to ask the question, why did Uber not exist a few years ago? Well, because you have to have a whole lot of things in place and they have to come together to make it work. 
10 years ago, even 15 years ago, we didn't have GPS plus online payment system plus big data plus artificial intelligence plus everyone has smartphones plus 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 you have to have all these things to make change happen and so when you have convergence you can make completely new solutions and we'll see a lot more than that <clears throat> so here's a factory scene that you're probably quite familiar with Oops. let's see how I'm doing here okay good <clears throat> This factory is making cars. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good, right? Yeah, I worked that out. There's only two humans in this picture, and I don't know what they're doing, because all the robots are doing all the work here. This is a, a new factory, a, a fourth industrial revolution type factory, and there's two interesting things happening here. One is that, yeah, you found them? Yeah. They're just hanging out. I think they're getting paid to do another one. <laughs> it's so that the guys who run the factory and the gals say, yeah, we hire people. <laughs> We don't know what they do, but we hire them. Um, so when, when, when the robots anticipate, they can anticipate when there's gonna be a problem with the production line. They know when there's gonna be a problem, they can, then they can alert someone to fix it. But here's the cool thing. If they find something that's broken, if something gets broken, the robots fix it themselves. These are self-healing production lines. So a combination of robotics and artificial intelligence. Not a lot of roles for humans in this picture. So that's mass production. Then we go to personal production. We can now make things really awesome things for one person at a time, right? Guess, you can guess where this is, right? Yeah, it's in space. The International Space Station. Pretty awesome project. That's a nice global project. Now, if you have a broken piece on the International Space Station, if you, something breaks, it's not like they have a spare part for everything. This thing isn't, I mean, it's huge, but it's not that big for storing stuff. Sometimes you have to wait for you know, a cargo ship, a supply ship to come up and provide the parts. So you, you have a broken piece and you're like, well, like, I guess we'll have to wait three weeks because <laughs> the supply ships aren't coming that often. Well, wouldn't it be cool to be able to just 3D print, actually print the part on the spaceship? So they do that now, and that's one of the uses of what's called additive printing or 3D printing, right? which is another flavor of this fourth industrial revolution. Okay, so I want to talk about cities here in the last part of my talk. Who lives in a city? Everybody. <laughs> and you're not alone. The world is moving into cities. Right? It wasn't so long ago, it was just prior to 2008, that most people in the world lived in the countryside. 2008, right? And in 2008, or 2009 on one day, the majority of humans were living in cities, 51%. And it's actually moving quite fast. How many people do you think move into cities every week in the world from the countryside? 200. 200 people? I'm talking about in the world. In the world, how many people move into cities every single week? About 100,000? About 3,000? In the world? Much higher. It's much, much higher. 200,000. 200,000? Who said? What's he say? 3 million? The answer is three million. <laughs> Very good, you got a spot on, well done. Three million people move in from the countryside to cities every week. That's a lot of refrigerators. Right? Because people who move in the cities want everything that we have. Right? Um, and we're urbanizing very rapidly. That's, you like the guessing stuff, let's do more guessing. Um, so we're building city infrastructure. Every month, how much city infrastructure do you think we build? And, and you, can, you can think of it in terms of the number of a city or a number of buildings. What, what do you think? How much infrastructure do we build to urbanize every month? What would be your guess? Yeah, you, it's a hard one to do, I guess. Um, well, let me give you the answer. It's uh, the same, the equivalent urbanization of the city of New York. Every month is built in the world. Right. And by the way, that will continue for 30 years. We'll be building the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 30 years. That's a lot of refrigerators, <laughs> isn't it? Air conditioners, microwave ovens, it's a lot of stuff. Um, okay, so you get it now. Not only do we all live in cities, but the world's gonna live in cities. By the middle of the century, 70%, by the end of the century, most humans will be in cities. Nobody will be in the countryside. Or we be in these big mega urban areas, and um, 
and your children and friends and your children's children all live in cities. So cities better, better be pretty good places to live. We want that to happen, right? Because that's where we're going to stay. This is a typical city office, or it looks like one, how you might imagine it. Where do you think this is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I think you've been there. I think this lady's been there, this young lady. Um, this is the DMV in San Francisco. Um, I didn't know that, by the way, when I chose this picture. I just got a, you know, a Creative Commons image online and I used it. Um, but we do think of, of, of city services like that, when in reality we like it like that, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to go to City Hall, really, or a city building. What, what a pain in the neck. And by the way, what a, not a great use of your time. Right? You should be able to do most things. So we have a great opportunity to move all these services online. Great opportunities for jobs and for um, creating businesses. It's a multi-trillion, with a T, multi-trillion dollar opportunity. Um, and we need to encourage people to participate in the innovation, to reinvent their cities. I just throw this up here. I used to be one of the main guys in Palo Alto, and we had these challenges to bring people in and use data. This is an example of a data site. You can check it out if you want, no obligation. <clears throat> so our cities are dramatically changing the way they deliver services. And you can be, and you are going to be part of that. And you're gonna be part of that. Um, again, here's, this is actually New York. Some of you might've seen this. Free internet, yeah, you've seen it. Um, uh, I, I understand a lot of people just sit there and watch movies for free. You technically could do it, I guess. Uh, sometimes not the best movies in the world, let me say. Um, you could do emergency, you know, calling on that, get, get the police officer to come if you need one, look for directions, all sorts of things. So the infrastructure is going to change to reflect what we expect in our environment so we have better experiences. <clears throat> we might even see robots. We're going to see robots turn up, right? I was recently in Singapore and there, that country is, you know, whilst people want to move there, there's no room for anyone, so they don't have a lot of immigration. There's not a lot of immigration, but they have more and more demands on to provide the services. And so I was working with the hospitality industry, and the reason I was working with them is because there's no more humans, so they have to build robots and art, you know, automated systems to do the jobs that humans used to do because they don't have enough people. Right, so we're going to see more robots and automation in our environment. <clears throat> What's going to change the way that we consume and produce energy? And by the way, this is actually one of the good stories. Right? I know a lot of you, I know all of you actually are passionate about the environment. And so it can often be a kind of a pessimistic topic, right? It can be kind of a bit, a bit sad. Right? But there's, there's always areas where things are going right. You know, we just, if we apply ourselves, humans can, can do a lot of cool stuff. And we are going to be likely producing a lot of energy through the sun. That, that beautiful ball of sunshine that every morning rises and every evening sunsets, right? Free and abundant. If we could leverage it right, it would give us all the energy we ever needed. We'd never have to tap any oil or gas out of the earth again, right? We're a little distance away from that. We've got some time to go to get there. We might even have cars that just don't even require any charging. They don't have to be plugged in. And our environments will be covered in sensors so we can do things like test the air, make sure that the air is clear. Right? So lots of new things happening in our cities. And by the way, each of these represents an opportunity for you, maybe an area of interest. But the future is gonna be a lot different than the one in which we live. By the way, one of the tough things about being an innovator, about creating your own business, having your own ideas, is you have to create them for a world that doesn't yet exist. That's, how, that's why it's so hard. When you create a new business in Silicon Valley, you're really creating the business for tomorrow, not for what the world is like today. Right? And so we can't think of solving problems. We can't think of the world the same way as it is today when we solve problems. We're gonna have flying cars in completely different ways of living. Now, I could do a talk on our cities and our future if I didn't talk about the planet. Right? You guys are all in tune with this. Um, everything that we do in the fourth industrial revolution, this revolution that we're part of right now, will be influenced by, by the environment. Right? The temperature is going up. And so where there are floods, the floods will be greater. Where there is wind, the wind will be stronger. Where there's rain, there'll be more rain. Where it's heat, there'll be more heat. It's more extremes. And in a way, we can probably manage it, but it's gonna happen. We're smart and we're creative and we'll do things. The earth will survive. 
The question is more, what is our experience? What will we experience in this, in this new world? So this will help define the things we do, how we create our businesses and the jobs we have, and our values, and how we consume, all these important things, right? So we can't think of the future, we can't think of our future without thinking about it in the context of climate change. Now, I'm gonna leave you with just this one slide. And you have to look carefully. The folks in the back might struggle with this. There's a little dot right here. That's what I want you to look at, that little, little dot there, right? That is the uh, pale blue dot. Can anyone guess what that is? Earth. Yes. <laughs> that is Earth, that little pale blue dot. That little pale blue dot in, a, in an empty, colossal-sized universe, right? So remember Voyager, do you ever hear Voyager? Back in the, uh, we, we launched this uh, incredible piece of technology in the 70s that would go around the solar system and take pictures of the planets. And when it was done, it would head out into the unknown. And in 1990, Voyager 1, because there was two, just in case one didn't work. <laughs> Voyager 1 was leaving our solar system about four billion miles away. It was getting ready to go. It still communicates with us, by the way, it's incredible. So it's going four billion miles and it's headed out at amazing speed. And a famous astrophysicist, his name was Carl Sagan, amazing guy, fortunately passed away, but he uh, made a big difference on this country and on the world as an astrophysicist. He was involved in this project. He said, hey guys, and he said this to NASA, he says, when, it, when Voyager's leaving, could you turn it around and take a picture of the Earth? And the folks at NASA said, you're crazy. <laughs> We're gonna do that. And, well, it was Carl Sagan. So they turned it around and took a picture. And then turned around and flew out at you know, phenomenal speed. It's a long ways away now, but it's still communicating with us. Took this picture, the pale blue dot. And Carl Sagan took a look at it, and he was so impacted by it, he wrote an essay called The Pale Blue Dot. And whilst I haven't memorized it, I plan to memorize it. I will just give you, I will just sort of give you paraphrases from it, paraphrase of his little story. He went, goes a little bit like this, he says, on that little pale blue dot is every single human that ever lived and will ever live. Right? On that pale blue dot is every argument you've ever had, every war we've ever had, everything you've ever complained about, every border we've built, every machine we've built, every meal we've had, every bit of racism, every bit of hatred, every bit of niceness is on that pale blue dot. And nobody's coming to save us, it looks like. We're alone. We're alone in this vast big universe. All we have is ourselves. All we have is our little thing and each other. It's quite sobering. It's quite sobering because it should remind us that we really ought to be focused on kindness and being together and not having borders and being a unified humanity. So I want to leave you with that. I want you to think, I know you think about that deeply. Lots of people think about this. It's, a, it's an image that reminds us of this. And so I'm left with just a question for you as I wrap up here today, which is, you know, you might not think of it, but you have to make some decisions soon, right? Lots of decisions about what you're going to do, how you're going to spend your life, you know, what your values are going to be. And so uh, here I am telling you you have the benefit of knowing that we are at the start of a fourth industrial revolution. By the way, the guys and the guys and gals in the prior revolutions didn't know, but I'm telling you, we are at the start of one. And you get the choice now. You actually get the heads up that there's big change ahead. And the essential question for you is, what role do you want to play? And to really sort of make it very profound, I ask you this question, do you want to be a winner? Or do you want to be a loser? That's the essential question of the fourth industrial revolution. So thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks.